A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, the 55th chapter, starting at the 10th verse. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish what I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall <laughs> clap their hands. Instead of the thorn, instead of the thorn, shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar that shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not ever be cut off. The word of the Lord. A reading from the epistle to the Romans, the eighth chapter starting at the first verse. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of skin, sinful flesh and to deal with sin he condemns sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you, who are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Hear the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, 
and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen but never understand, and you will indeed look but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing. And they have shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Yeah, this morning we're going to look at Matthew 13, that long passage we just heard read, and uh, it's a well-known parable. We don't use parables a lot in our daily communication, I would guess, uh, in marriages or friendships or at workplaces or things like that. But maybe we should, because communicating is hard. It's, it's tough to communicate well, to speak and also hear well. In February of 93, I was, uh, it was 30 years ago, I was in Paris for the first time. I was walking down the Champs-Élysées, and I realized on my first day in Paris that I'd forgotten to pack any soap. And so it's the kind of thing a 22-year-old does. And so I uh, spotted a little boutique off to my left uh, that had soap in the window, and I walked in and there were two very pretty French women behind the counter and determined to impress them with my seven years of French studies, I confidently said, bonjour, <laughs> followed by je, and then my mind went blank. <laughs> and so I lamely said soap, bonjour, je soap, and <laughs> 
They didn't laugh at me the way you're laughing at me, but uh, they smiled kindly and said, one of them said, tu as besoin du savon, uh, you need some soap, monsieur? And I s mustered my very best Parisian accent and I said, oui. <laughs> Communicating is, is tough uh, in any language, so Jesus uses parables, he uses stories. Now here in Matthew 13, our reading today, he tells seven parables in a row, all on the same topic about the kingdom of heaven. Now this first one, it's the longest one, but seven parables in a row, same topic, and it's because he doesn't want his disciples to confuse kingdoms of men with the kingdom of God, human kingdoms with the heavenly kingdom. So consider this. You tell me, how do earthly kingdoms get established? How do they come about? Conquering kings, force, armies, politics, alliances. But how does the kingdom of heaven come about? Well, in our parable today, it's through hearing. Over and over, Jesus says, hear, listen, don't you hear, don't you listen. So the point of the parable, the main point, there's many points to it, sub points. The main point is that listening is a primary skill for receiving the kingdom of heaven. So let's look at this parable briefly, each part. We're told a farmer, he's sowing seed, and that seed lands in four different places with four different outcomes. First, the seed lands on hard soil, out on the path where it's been beaten down and the seed can't penetrate the ground, and birds later eat it. So what's Jesus teaching here? Well, here it is. It's beware of listening to the word of God with a hard heart, with only your brain. You see, it's possible to be in regular contact with God's word. You can attend church, you can hear sermons, you can read devotionals, and yet the kingdom of God never takes root within you because it's just an exercise. And maybe, maybe it's a social exercise. Maybe you come because that's what people do. They go to church. Maybe you come because your spouse makes you or because uh, your parents make you or because your kids expect it. Maybe it's an intellectual exercise. Maybe it's a moral one. But your contact with God's word is not personal. It's just theory. And Jesus goes on to say that this is actually fertile ground for the work of the evil one to come and snatch away the word. So if you've never, if you've never been lifted up by God's word, if you've never been energized by it, it hasn't probably penetrated you. And you actually, I think you know if that happens, you know if God's word has affected you. And if you're unsure, it probably hasn't happened. That's the first outcome. The second outcome, seed lands on rocky soil. So what you're to think of here is like a rock with maybe an inch of earth on top of it. Okay, so the seed goes down, it gets into the earth, but when it germinates, there's no place for it to put down roots. And once the heat comes out, the heat of the day, it dies because it doesn't have roots. So the second group, these are people who, they receive God's word with joy. I mean, they spring up. And this is maybe more scary than the first group because here you've got people who are excited about Jesus. It's not just theory for them. They feel that Jesus has changed their lives, but beware. They have shallow roots. So when things are great, they seem to have real faith. But when things aren't great, they can't take the heat. As soon as trouble or suffering comes, they say something like this. What good is Jesus if I can't have the life I want? And you see their problem? They thought they were entering into Jesus' kingdom, but they were really trying to get Jesus into their kingdom. They didn't want a savior. They wanted a blesser, a sugar daddy, not a king. As long as this group has what they want, they say yes to Jesus. As soon as they can't get what they want, they ditch him. Third outcome, and I want to spend most of my time on this one this morning. This is where the seed lands in the soil, it germinates, it takes root, but it says that thorns grow up around them and choke them out. And Jesus explains what the thorns are. He says they are two things, the cares of this world and delight in riches, or our translation said, lure. 
of riches. Let's look at the cares of this world. There are legitimate cares in this world that everyone has and that every Christian has, and there's nothing wrong with any of them. For example, as a Christian, you might have these legitimate cares. You might have children you need to care for, uh, parents, well-earned vacations that you take, a house, a mortgage, college educations, um, car payments, friendships are a care of this world, your health. Every one of those things is important, but unless we're attentive, little by little, each of those cares can overtake our relationship with the Lord and rob us of that relationship, choking out our faith. Now, the other weed that Jesus mentions is delight in riches. Sometimes this makes people uncomfortable. Now, nowhere in the Bible does the Bible condemn riches. The Bible says that wealth is a blessing from the Lord to be used wisely. And even if we're not wealthy, we have to be wise with what we have and provide for those who've been put in our care. But the Bible also says it's possible, and it happens, that love of money diminishes our trust in the Lord. Now, you might be thinking today, I'll bet some of you are, well, I don't have a lot of money, so this is not my problem. Now, it actually doesn't matter how much money you have. Remember, it's not money that is the root of all evil. What is it? It's love of money. First Timothy 6.10 says it is love of money that is the root of all evil. You don't have to have a lot of money to love it. You can be broke and believe that money has the power to satisfy you. You can be penniless or rich and be enthralled by money. And when that happens, it chokes out the Lord's presence in our life. So, it happens with frightening regularity that the cares of this world and the love of money choke out the kingdom of heaven. No one starts out that way in their faith journey, but over time, these things can overshadow us. Now, it's pretty easy to recognize the first two groups. You know, the group, the seed falls on the hard soil and is snatched away, the seed that takes root and then just sort of dies. But it's really hard with this third group. It's hard to tell the difference between people in the third group and in the fourth group because the kingdom of heaven takes root in both of them. Uh, this third group, they don't fall away under pressure. They don't leave Christian community when times get tough. The people in group three, they stick around. So how do you know who's in group three or whether you're in group three? Here's how. These people don't bear fruit. I'll put that another way. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 5, and 23, he talks about, you remember the fruit of the spirit. And he names nine things. It's not an exhaustive list, but joy, uh, love, kindness, self-control, faithfulness, gentleness. I got them out of order, so I'm not going to remember all of them. But these attributes of Jesus, right, these characteristics of Jesus, that a person who is growing in their faith, you should be able to look at them five years from now, ten years from now, and say, this person has grown. There is fruit in their life. They're more loving they, than they used to be. They're more joyful than they used to be. They're more kind than they used to be. They have more self-control than they used to be. But if they don't have fruit in their life, if they haven't grown, if they've stalled in their journey, it may be that they find themselves here in this third group. They may be committed to Jesus, but he's their co-pilot. There's no fruit. Then there's a fourth group. The seed takes root, it flourishes, it bears fruit. You can see the change in their life. There is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control growing in their lives. And that's, of course, where we all want to be is in group four. So how do you get into group four? All through this parable and in the part in between, Jesus tells us that one of the ways the kingdom of heaven enters you is by hearing, by listening, by receiving. Think about earthly kings. I mean, let's take three. Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, Napoleon. When they brought their kingdoms on this earth, it was like a hammer on the world. But the kingdom of God, Jesus says, it's like a seed. What does a seed do in order to live? It's got to die before it lives, right? 
Uh, earthly kings use sword to shape reality. A seed works organically. Jesus' kingdom comes weak and vulnerable like a seed, and it seems to die, as seeds do, but it comes to life almost subversively within a person. So how do we allow the kingdom of God to take root inside of us? First, whether you get it or not, whether you understand it or not, the first thing is always saying yes to Jesus. Because Jesus is the ultimate seed. He's the ultimate weak and vulnerable seed that died on the cross. And then on the third day, rose from the dead and became the source of life. The first way the kingdom comes inside of you is yes to Jesus. Now, once you've done that, there are a thousand ways to invite the kingdom to grow within you. And I'm just going to give you three this morning as a suggestion. And you may think of another one that works better for you. First, I want to suggest that you try reading God's word in places where you don't normally read God's word. I was just in Israel, and we were reading God's word everywhere. On the Via Dolorosa with, you know, 100 people passing by us every three minutes. Uh, we read it on the southern steps of the temple, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, all kinds of places. And it tends to stick with you uh, when you do it in different places than you might normally do it. Uh, let me give you a suggestion tonight, the dinner table. Uh, it doesn't take long. It may seem weird to you, but have a go. You know, we have vacation Bible school starting a week from tomorrow and they're going to be doing the book of Esther. It's 10 chapters. It's a great read. All, even if you don't believe the Bible is true, it's still a great story. Let me suggest this. Read Esther at the dinner table. Just do it and see uh, how that impacts you over the course of 10 days. Use a different translation like the message. Second, if you're a regular reader of the Bible uh, through devotionals, I don't want you to stop. But if you're only using devotionals for your Bible study, you need to do more. Uh, our Daily Bread, My Utmost for His Highest, um, Jesus Calling, these are all great devotionals. But how much scripture do they usually give you each day? Anyone? About a verse or two, right? They're microdosing you with scripture. And I'd rather have you get microdosed than nothing at all. But you can't settle for that. You need more than microdoses of scripture every day. So, you know, do this thing at the table or somewhere else and uh, get more of the scripture into yourself. Third, talk about what you read with other people. I will never on my own learn all that I need from the scriptures. I actually, you are going to see things in the Bible that I am never going to see. And I am going to see things in the Bible that you are never going to see. And we really need to be in conversation about the scriptures. So you need to be talking with other people about... Uh, about what you're reading. I had a, I was a, I had one, this was not part of my sermon. It's always dangerous when a minister says this wasn't part of my sermon, but I'll close with this because <laughs> it's a good story. I was at bagpipe camp uh, two weeks ago and uh, they, they put me in the, I'm calling it the fraternity house. Instead of the, the family lodging, in which uh, had children in it, I got put with 16 other guys uh, who until three in the morning every night were either playing their drums or playing their bagpipes. Could be heaven, could be hell, depending on, uh, you know, you. Um, it's a little bit of both for me. Uh, the final night, I, I said, I can't beat it, so I'll join it. So I stayed up till three and played my bagpipes, uh, which was fun. But I got into this conversation, and I told this guy he was going to end up in one of my sermons. He, uh, he came out on the porch and told me he was an atheist, but he had a Bible in his hand. And I, he probably knew the Bible better, I'm going to guess, than 90% of the people in this room. Kind of like the person in group one, a hard soil. Uh, he, it was an exercise for him. And uh, we had long, long conversations about this. But in the end, he actually, you know, successfully um, had a conversation with me in which he pointed out some things to me I hadn't noticed in the scriptures. And I was able to point out things that he hadn't noticed. And so uh, even in a conversation with I think he was really a believer. He was calling himself an atheist for effect. But uh, even in that conversation, uh, talking about the scriptures, it really does make a difference in your journey. So don't just read it, don't microdose, and don't just do it on your own. Uh, we need each other in this journey. Would you stand and let's pray. Father, it would be asking 
too much of us today to self-identify or to analyze where we are in this journey, which group we fall into, but Lord, uh, we want to be in group four. We want to be people uh, who are receptive to the kingdom of heaven. And so we ask that you would do that work, whatever it is within each one of us, to make us receptive to your presence, to your word, to your voice, to your guidance, to your salvation, to your healing. Whatever it is we're lacking, Lord, we ask for more of you today. And we pray, remove whatever barriers are inside of us so that kingdom of heaven may fully take root and that fruit may develop and that we might become the people that you have created, redeemed, and called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.